The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to the webinar. I just wanted to let you know, we'll go ahead and give people a minute or two to start up and then we'll get started. Thanks. Welcome everyone today. The topic today for today's webinar is the art of creating a target variable and predictive modeling. So I'm Rajiv Shah, I'm a data scientist at Data Robot, and we're starting this new technical series of webinars. Our guest today is gonna to be Lucas to talk about this. Before we jump in and introduce him, I just wanted to lay out some housekeeping pieces. This is the first in our series of webinars. We'll be having these webinars on a weekly basis. Next week, we'll have a webinar by Mike Taverne talking about data engineering. The other piece is if you have questions during the webinar, feel free to ask them, ask them all along. I will try to interrupt Lucas when it's appropriate to answer the questions, but otherwise we'll save a little bit of time near the end to answer questions as well. All right, I'd like to introduce my good friend and colleague, Lucas. Lucas, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your background and kind of your journey to Data Robot and what you do at Data Robot. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Rajiv. So, hi everyone. I'm Lucas. Uh, I'm a lead data scientist at Data Robot. Um, I'm based in our London office, um, but as you can hear from my heavy German accent, um, I originally come from Germany, which is why I'm, I'm kind of. Um, covering a lot of uh, Europe, Germany, Switzerland as part of my day-to-day -day job. Um, I'm with the company since two years. Before Data Robot, I spent five years in the retail industry, um, did all sorts of different machine learning related use cases um, for big supermarkets. Um, and then I decided I wanted to see something else, something uh, other than retail, uh, which is why I decided to come to Data Robot. Yeah, no, Lucas has a lot of great skills, and one of the things I like is if I bring an interesting data science project along, he'll happily jump into it. So I know we've collaborated quite a bit on the past. So, all right, keep going. Yeah, indeed. Um, so, yeah, shall we um, jump right in? Um, I want to actually first a uh, little bit talk about why um, I kind of came up with this topic. So um, I don't know, Rajiv, about you, but uh, whenever I um, try to find out something about a new use case, um, obviously I first Google around and see if there's some tutorial, somebody else did something on it already. Um, and what I found is that 
a lot of those um, tutorials actually they they just use pre-prepared data so data from Kaggle from these kind of competitions or up from other kind of sources and then therefore they kind of skip a few steps along the way I don't know did you see the same uh, uh, wait a minute they, are you telling me that Kaggle competitions aren't like what you do in data science every day they are part of it <laughs> but they're not exactly all of it so um, I, I did a little bit of research when I just um, had a look at the first um, page of Google results and um, out of the first five results, three actually just jump in having a pre-prepared data set uh, which comes from Kaggle and they, you know, start jumping right into the feature engineering and um, different modeling techniques, etc. Um, one of them does discuss some options on how to actually come up with a target. And um, a fifth one is just uh, telling us that machine learning is indeed a good idea and we should do it. So I thought um, if nobody's covering this, um, maybe it makes sense to actually talk a little bit about this part of data science, which seems to be kind of overlooked, is underrepresented in the documentation that's out there. And um, my next thought actually was, you know, uh, we, we probably all know it, but um, I, I should maybe uh, quickly talk about this. The novel by Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In this novel, people build the supercomputer um, and they ask the supercomputer to give them the answer, the answer to life, the universe and everything. Um, the supercomputer goes away, it calculates for oh, six million years and then in the end it comes up with the answer, which is 42. And um, those scientists then ask the computer, are you sure about this? Did you actually check this? Yes, double check, triple check, it's indeed 42. So the scientists then decided to uh, you know, build another computer to come up with, well, what is the question? And um, this is indeed, it's exactly the same as um, what we're having here, right? When, whenever we come up with a target variable in our machine learning data sets, uh, this is indeed thinking about what is really the question I'm trying to have answered. Because that's exactly what you do. You, you model a problem to um, answer a certain question. And if you don't really think about this question enough, you might actually end up getting something which isn't really what you want or what you need. Yeah. Um, and I just reinforce that point all the way. I mean, it's one of the things we often, in the data science education we do at Data Robot, when we talk to our customers, it's always focused on, let's think about, right? What is the larger business problem? What is the question? So totally like where you're going. Exactly, and it, it's a big and important step. Um, I want to actually go a little bit further than only that. It's not only about the target itself, it's also um, kind of somehow around it. Should we even, you know, try to answer this question? Um, because in a, in a lot of cases, uh, once you dig a little bit further, uh, you might end up, um, figuring out that some, something else might have been much, much better uh, problem to solve, um, maybe as a first step, and then you, know, uh, you can always continue on that. So uh, without further ado, um, I want to focus here on um, the topic of churn modeling. So hey, we want and to- And Lucas, just, just so yeah. you know, the, the slides seem to be taking a little bit of delay for showing. So I'm still looking at the what is the question slide right now. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. I'm, I'm still on the what is the question ah, slide. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, let, let me actually go to the next one. Right. So indeed, um, what we want to focus on here is um, we want to talk about churn. Um, and customer churn is obviously, um, you know, is a customer going to leave us at some point or not? Uh, now, this is not already well defined, right? Because um, churn might mean something very, very different depending on what kind of services you offer and what kind of industry you're in. And um, I have a um, uh, admittedly incomplete list here of um, certain services that you might come across or you might have in your own uh, businesses. And uh, we can see, you know, if it's a subscription type service like an insurance policy or, you know, your Netflix or something like that, um, it's fairly straightforward because you will have a cancellation date or the end of the contract. And after that, um, the customer stops being a customer. In which case, it's fairly straightforward to define it. But uh, what about, you know, retailing? Um, if you're a grocery retailer, you might have people shopping weekly with you, but maybe only every two weeks, maybe only four weeks, maybe they go on holidays, right? 
Uh, we don't want to flag a customer as a churn customer just because they went on their two-week holidays. So here we need to um, think a little bit about what exactly the like how we how should we define the churn event itself. Um, typically, it is though some some um, period of inactivity, and the crucial point here is if you are in a data science team, you should really work together with your business team to define this together, right? Because they will have a lot of insight on um, what is actually important. Um, you might want to look at the distribution of your typical gaps um, in, in, um, in the demand or in the, in the transactions that you see of your customers. But um, in, in, in the end, there's going to be some sort of period of inactivity. And by that time, you say, OK, the churn event has happened um, and you know exactly what it is. And then we have um, the, the third option here. A very, very intermittent demand. So I recently moved house and I bought a new sofa um, with a you know home retailer. And um, it's very unlikely that I'm going to buy another one anytime soon. Right? I, I don't have that much space in my house. So in this case, it, it might not even make sense to talk about churn in any case. So there's other options you want, might want to do. Obviously, there's still something we can do with machine learning. It's more about kind of, um, you know, reactivating customers, but churn itself might not have the most sense, it's not well defined in these cases. No, this is really good. And I always kind of like to use churn because it's pretty much an example of a use case every every kind of enterprise or company has to do with. And it's something that's usually pretty intuitive for most people to understand with. So no, I like this example. Awesome. All right, um, let's go to the next slide. So the other question we should ask, um, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's slightly beside the topic of um, actually creating the target, but something to consider nonetheless um, is when we identify those um, customers that have a high likelihood of churning, what do we even do with that? Um, because there are, I've, I've seen this in the past. Um, data scientists have spent a lot of time coming up with a very good model to uh, predict that a customer is going to churn, but there was no way of preventing them from doing this. So in the end, they knew very well, we are going to lose these customers, but that was it. End of story, they were losing these customers. So you also have to think about before you even start this, are there any interventions we can do, right? So some options would be, you know, if you're a retailer, give them some discounts, um, maybe offer free delivery, phone call, email, et cetera, right? Um, the other option, um, so the other part of this is this needs to be effective. So customers actually then need to change their behavior. So if we give them a discount and they still churn, then all we've done is uh, lose some money. And cost effective as well. So this is kind of both of these together. If the only way we can uh, get our customers to stay with us is by continue to give them discounts and there are customers, and I've, I've seen this in my in my time as a, you know working in retail. And um, there are indeed certain types of customers who just wait for for you to send them the coupons, and they know they will come, and then they only shop when you give them coupons. So this is something. If we only have those customers, then we might not even want to um, prevent them from churning. So these things are all important to consider because in the end, it it um, if by doing this, you end up losing more money. Um, you, it's kind of besides the point, yes. No, and then I think this is really important, right? This is just putting that business context of what does this actually decision actually mean to the organization and how should you think about it and not just tackling it as, hey, I have rows and columns, let's build a data, let's build a model. Exactly. Each machine learning model should always have some sort of uh, relation to reality um, because otherwise, uh, you know, we don't really get any value. Unless you're in academia, um, then of course, um, go ahead. Right, um, next thing is, so this is again about the cost um, effectiveness. We we have our customers, and let's say we, we know the risk um, of each customer to churn. If we know that uh, whatever intervention we do is only going to cost us money, but doesn't have a very high success rate, uh, we should just ignore those and uh, focus on those where we actually do have a high success rate. So after we build our machine learning model and we have the answer, we might still not want to actually apply this on each and every customer. And um, in this case, I would build a second model. 
uh, which is about um, the redemption rate of coupons or you know, whatever. It should be. Um, moving on, let's be a bit more uh, concrete on, um, on the churn, uh, on the different types of modeling churn. So as we said, the target is important, but um, we, 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 can have, we can think about certain scenarios. So sometimes you're interested in knowing if a new customer is, has a very high like lot of churning within a certain time frame. Um, a lot of companies out there, they work like this. They, they give some sort of subscription basis or some service and they count on the customer sticking around for long enough um, to then um, make, make money by doing that, right? They can upsell, they can uh, continue um, doing the life cycle to, to add more services on top. Now, if there's a high likelihood that these people will churn before we even get them, um, before we can get to these upsell opportunities, um, that's of course a bad thing. And we might you know, want to either give them a higher price in the first place or not target them at all. So this would be um, on the early churners. Now, a different um, concept is your kind of day-to-day -day churners, right? So existing customers, um, we just want to know for each of my, for all of my customers in my current portfolio, what is the likelihood of them churning within the next N months? So the example here is, of course, six months, but this could change depending on um, your, your business needs. Now, in this case, we actually do sl something slightly different, and we're going to uh, into more details on how this can look like. Right? How how would you actually look at the data and prepare the target here? But um, the the difference is important because in these cases here, we only take into account everything we know about the the new customer once when they first join um, our business, and in this case, we know a lot more about our customers because they have had time to to do transactions to contact us to put complaints on the website and um, reviews etc and then we have repeat journals which is um, indeed a, a special case of this uh, which is only uh, looking at okay somebody has churned returned and um, what's the likelihood that will you know churn again and, and um, just, to, kind of, yeah, just right. to clarify this so are you saying that the, the, somebody should pick one of these questions or all of these questions or kind of you've laid a couple of scenarios out just trying to get a feel for this you it, it, it might make sense to do each of these but you have to really think about uh what is the the most pressing issue in um in your current organization and here it's very very important to again talk to the business side really i try to understand their needs totally and um, they, they will tell you um what what is you know what is their problem right now? They might not always be able to, to translate that into a um, machine understandable problem. That is the role of a data scientist really, right? And it's kind of translating business problems. So they, they might tell you, um, all of the customers that we have, we, we really want to upsell to them, but before we, they always join. And you know, it's one of these. Now I'm making this sound quite easy. In the end, uh, you will have, um, quite a few discussions um, to really find out what, what's actually the problem. Um, but in most organizations, actually these two uh, will probably make sense. Um, but talk to the business, see what's the most pressing issue and then go for that. No, this is great, thanks. Awesome. Um, all right, uh, moving on. So let's um, see. So. If we if we go for the first version here, will the customer churn within the first n months? There's a few pros and cons. Um, it is a fairly simple uh, problem to set up. We can use a lot of historical observations because we can use every single customer's starting point, um, and it doesn't really matter what the customer then does in in the meantime because we wouldn't be able to use it anyway when we want to make predictions on new customers. Um, now, of course, the cons, um, that's exactly that. If there are complex situations and uh, this might help us um, to, to find out a little bit more, um, you know, the activity, the transactions, their spend with us, et cetera. These are all, this is all information we cannot actually use in this case because for new customers, we just don't know. Um, we, we can obviously try to um, work this, um, 
don't do it at the very beginning, but maybe during the first two weeks or so. Um, and the con here is this will then make it more complex um, to do the data preparation. And then if there's um, customer behaviors change over time, then of course those very, very early customers, the first ones we have in our, in our database, might have a very different behavior to um, customers that we saw recently. And this is how this looks like. So this is really um, how you can think about it visually. Um, in this graphic here, each of these uh, rows represent one customer journey. They onboarded, so they came to our uh, organization, we, and then they stayed until some churn event happened or might not have happened. And when we talk about this kind of early churn problem, we would first define, okay, what is the time frame we want to look at? In this case, it's three months. Then we take each customer's history. We see, did the churn occur within the first three months? Um, and we then define our label like so, right? So this, this person here did churn, but later, so it's a zero, um, zero, zero. This person here churned within the three month period. So they, they get a one. And um, again, it's zero, even though they churned actually twice. I like this slide a lot. And I also want to kind of give a shout out to Mitch, one of our Chicago area data scientists who had to build this to explain these concepts to a customer, which we've kind of borrowed now for everybody's use. Indeed. Thank you very much, Mitch. Um, one thing to note here, right? So this is fairly straightforward. Um, as you can see, the, the point is you kind of, for every row in your data set is one customer and the time period we're looking at, there's no one defined start date because the start date is going to be the one where the customer onboarded and this might be a random date, right? We don't actually, uh, the start of each of our rows or the time period this refers to uh, moves with the customer's onboarding date. And that's kind of important here because as we will see um, in the next uh, way of defining the target, that's going to look different. Um, another thing we can um, talk about here is the first three months might be interesting, but what about the first six months, the first nine months, the first year? Um, you can actually consider to build multiple models, and that is typically um, the uh, best way, the best practice of um, solving these types of problems. So you would build a three month model, you build a six month model, you build a 12 month model. Um, and that gives you more granularity, right? Because sometimes you are actually interested in, okay, this person is going to stay pretty likely to stay at least three months, but fairly unlikely to stay 12 months. So you have a certain time frame where you can still do your upsell activity, whatever it is you want to do. Um, and you might want to treat those people differently um, because here we just say, okay, it's three months, but everything else is unknown to us. Yeah, no, I, I like building those multiple models out. It's a bit more work, but often you never know exactly kind of what the nuances of the situation, and what the churn behaviors are like. And sometimes you can get some interesting insights and um, as well as accuracy by trying different varieties. Yeah, all right, um, moving on. Um, so this would be the second case um, where we talk about is, this, is my customer, how I know him today or her, um, going to churn within the next few months. And um, rather than going through lots of text, let's just skip right ahead to this slide here. So it looks fairly different, right? Because here we actually do not care too much when the customer onboarded. They did onboard at some point. Um, actually, I might have, there we go. There was a transition here. Um, here we actually take a snapshot of the last six months of data. And we just have a look at, okay, every customer in our last six months, if they were active at the beginning of that, did they churn within, those, within this time frame? And the idea, the idea in this case is, if we, if we take this model and now make a prediction on our customers as we know them today, the prediction is of course going to be, what's the likelihood of them churning within the next six months, even though we trained on the last six months, right? That's kind of the idea. We take this and move it forward. Um, again, it is fairly straightforward once you think about it like this. Um, we, we take a certain cutoff. So we, we move six months back from now. We then can, of course, aggregate some of this information we know about our customers. So we can 
for example, take into account their average spend, um, number of transactions, or you know how many movies that they watch, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Whatever we have information about our customers, and we pull this into our observation for this one specific customer. And our target is of course going to be the churn or not. And then we see the label here, one zero, one zero, and so forth. If the customer has already churned, we would not include them in our data. Because if we think about this, um, of my customers today, I want to know if a customer today is going to churn. If they already churned, I would not even want to make a prediction if they churn again because they're currently inactive. So these it's important to exclude them from your data, otherwise you might get a bias result. So, the idea yeah, is simple. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, no, and, and it makes sense, right? If your window is 36 months, if something happened before 36 months, right, excluding that um, makes total sense, right? Because we don't want yeah, to learn even, from the past. Even, oh, go ahead. Yeah, even, even within the 36 months, you would exclude this particular customer because currently they are not active, so, the ah. churn event will not happen within this time frame. The, the, yes, because your question is the let in the next six months. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, right. So take all of your customers, take the last six months, aggregate some of the activity of your customers in the time before, um, set your target, and build your model. Mm -hmm. So um, we can actually extend this a little bit because if I go back to the slide, um, we can only use each customer once in this example, right? So we have this customer, we can only use them uh, at this point in time. But what about, you know, a scenario where you have um, fluctuation over time, the seasonalities, maybe all of your churn events are, I don't know, during February, but uh, you train your model in summer. That would, of course, not really be very helpful, right? So we want to give our model a bit more information to look at. and. Um, this is exactly what this is about. Here we say, um, we, we take not only one observation per customer, but we take several um, observations per customer. And uh, we say, okay, did they churn in January, in February, in March, et cetera, right? And therefore we can actually take into account this uh, seasonality here, um, because this person might have churned in November, but another one might have churned in March. And then we, we do basically exactly the same as before, only we use, more of those um, oops, more of those um, instances here. So we take maybe this is only one month of data, could be two. Uh, we take this slice and we have our churn events here. We take this slice, we take our churn events here, etc. We can do this uh, further back as well, of course. Um, and the 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 pro um, yeah, of this is um, we we capture the seasonality. We have much more data to, to train our model on. Um, again, if you don't have many customers, if you're a business with only, you know, maybe a few bespoke customers, um, this is another good trick to just increase the amount of data that you use for modeling. No, that's a very interesting tip. Um, so feel free as people go through this, if you want to ask questions, um, we can do that. Um, so one of the questions um, that's already kind of come up is, so right now we're looking at whether or not somebody churned. Do you have any ideas if people want to take kind of the cost of churn into account, how they would handle that? Um, the cost of churn. So you would probably do this um, slightly different, right? So the churn event itself is, is kind of a nice thing because it's, it's, it's isolated, right? So everything mm -hmm. that you can isolate, it, it typically makes sense to build a model only for that. Um, and then on top of that, you might want to uh, build other models, right? So a, a very typical example might be a customer lifetime model. So let's say we, we, we know the risk of churn and we know the expected spend um, of our customer for the time they're still with us, right? Because now what you can do is you can, um, you can prioritize the, um, say we, we, we give the, customer with a high likelihood of churn, some voucher, uh, we would target those with a higher customer lifetime value. So with a higher likelihood of spending more money with us in the future. So you can basically focus on that. Excellent. And so can you talk a little bit more about kind of the final outputs of this? It looks like 
kind of at the individual basis, we'll have you know some number about them churning. Can you t give us a little bit more about the outputs of these models and how we would use them? Uh, yes, of course. So actually, what I can do is um, I can quickly jump into the data robot platform and um, show you a little bit about how this might look like. So once you have trained your, your churn model, obviously what we get is for each of our customers, we get a certain likelihood of them churning. And um, we, this model was actually quite able to distinguish between those with a very high likelihood and those with a very low likelihood. And now what we do is we say understand and have a look at which features were most influential to um, you know, predict this. Because this is something that we can then use to try to um, you know, add on top of our you know, vouchers or whatever we do as interventions. We can also work on other bits and pieces. So we can say in this case here, okay, how much they purchased during one year, that was a very high driver, how many days since the previous purchase in this case. And now we can't really change any of this, but um, we might be able to actually try to influence this to, to keep them on our website, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's various things we can do here. And then for every single individual customer, we can of course have a look at um, what were the main reasons for these? So we see here there's one person with a very high likelihood. Let's say they they um, were 170 days without buying anything, um, whereas these guys here have a very low low likelihood. Like we are almost certain they're going to say, well, they just bought something yesterday, right? So this is kind of how we can make sense of this and really try to understand. Okay, does our model really tell us what we firstly expect and secondly what is actionable? No, that's really useful because, yes, the, those insights are very valuable because then people can kind of act on that based on the value of the prediction. So it's not only kind of the likelihood of churning, but understanding why somebody might likely to churn seems very yes. valuable as well. Now, one thing I want to stress here is I didn't tell you what uh, targets I actually put in here, right? So we, we really need to know what the question was we asked beforehand before we can meaningfully derive any value out of these explanations here. And that's kind of the whole crucial point of this whole exercise um, is, you know, once we know what the question was, we can then really understand these bits, um, these, these insights here much better and uh, see how they help us answering that question. Yeah, no, this has been really good. I wanted to let everybody know um, there was a question already that came across about um, the content and having this available. I should have mentioned it earlier at the outset that this is being recorded and we will share the recordings with everybody that has signed up for the webinar as well. I've got a few questions that have come across. Um, if this is the time, if people have additional questions, we can ask Lucas these. Yeah, please do. So did you say there were already questions? Yes, there have been a few of the questions that I've already asked you here, and I'm gonna see if, oh, right, if okay. there's, <laughs> see which of the others um, make sense to kind of do. So one of the, th one of the questions, um, I, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to interpret this. Um, can you tell a little bit about kind of how the data, what's, what are the different ways data should be structured for this? Or what's, a, I mean, if somebody was doing this from scratch, what are the suggestions that you would have? Right, so um, a lot of times people um, would obviously use uh, tools like Python, uh, you know, or they have access to a database. And um, the, the, the important thing is firstly, gather all of your information into a single table. So your, your customer information, right? So where does the customer live, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we should have that information in one table. Um, and then we, we should look at the transaction history of the customer. If we look at um, the, the second way I was discussing um, to be able to aggregate that. So here we are. And basically what you do is, Everything that is in, in the tail here, right, 
um, you kind of should always try to keep separate because it's very important that you don't accidentally take information out of um, this part of the data into that part of the data. So um, let's say we, we have some information about we, you know, did we send a customer a voucher or not, right? Um, and let's say this information for, for, for whatever reason made its way um, from, from the future into our data here, right? So that, you know, we, we send them a voucher at this point in time. And now we accidentally included that in, in our model. Now the likelihood is that um, if that is indeed the case, the model will pick this up and say, oh, it's very high correlation between sending vouchers to customers and customers churning, but it might be completely the other way around. And um, somebody figured, oh, this customer has a high likelihood of churning, I better send them a voucher, right? And um, therefore it's, it's super important to kind of be very strict about keeping the past and the present and the future really separate from each other. So that's one thing. Um, apart from that, it's obviously important to, to be accustomed with certain data preparation tools. Um, in Data Robot, we have something that can help with that. Um, but of course, typically you get the data from maybe a, a SQL database, et cetera. So um, be accustomed with how to, how to use date features and filter by date. Uh, because as we see, right, if we want to say the last 36 months, uh, we should be, you know, and be able to to get exactly so we don't um, go go across here. Um, does that make sense? Um, or did you did you ta um, did you think about something else there, Rajiv? It, it does. And there's one more question that came across, and then we'll probably go ahead and end this. Um, you talked about kind of building multiple models. How much more is that incremental work of building those multiple models? Um, was a question. Right. Okay. So it depends a little bit on um, which part we are in. But um, if we if we uh, look at this um, this use case here, if the only thing we do is change the target variable here from three months to six months, the the query in SQL or in Python or in R that you you run, you will have to change that, and you build a separate data set where you know probably this oops uh, this zero here will then become a one um and the rest stays as it is right if you can think about this line just being a bit longer so it kind of that. so once you have that though so it's basically it's, it's almost the same data because everything at the onboarding stays the same it's just a target that changes slightly and they just run it again and if you start running models in data robot it's, it's really straightforward because what you do is you, you you pick your target, you hit start, and um, you get your insight. So that's actually not that much incremental effort. There is a little bit of effort when it comes to then using those predictions, because now instead of making one prediction per customer, we make two, right? So we get two probabilities out. So we then need to obviously take into account, okay, which is which, and what do I action on this? But um, again, this is something it's fairly straightforward to have multiple models in deployment and uh, keep track of uh, what's, how they behave. Yeah. Excellent, Lucas. Uh, thank you so much for jumping on today and talking with us. Just wanted to let everyone know, again, we'll be sending out a recording of this. Next week, we'll be doing a talk on data engineering. And a month from now, Carolyn, another one of our data scientists will be joining us in a talk. Please, if you have any other questions or feedback, feel free to quickly ask a question now, or we have a dedicated email address for this webinar series. It's AI success hyphen webinars at datarobot.com. It's, it's a little wordy, maybe we can get that improved, but AI success hyphen webinars at datarobot, or otherwise many of you know us, you have a customer facing data scientist as well, feel free to reach out to them. The last thing I want to mention is we also have a community forum, um, Data, Robot, um, Data Robots community. That's a website as well. And that's another place that you can go for questions and answers. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. All right. Thank you, Rajiv, for having me. Thank you.